we realized there was a very methodical killer. He had killed in the past and appeared likely to kill in the future. You know, you get that feeling when the hair on the back of your, your neck raise up. I can almost immediately see the similarities. It's a slipknot. The young black female, she was pregnant. She could have been sexually assaulted. It's almost like a needle in a haystack. Unless you find that particular suspect that matches, the investigation continues. We definitely knew at that time that this wasn't this guy's first radio. We was shocked. This is the guy. This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. Jacksonville, Florida is a major tourist hotspot known for its seaports, vibrant neighborhoods, and scenic coastline. But not far from the bustling beaches, there's a low-income neighborhood that will become the backdrop for a perverse and mysterious series of crimes. It begins in the heat and humidity of a July afternoon as Sharibia Mack heads to her sister's apartment. It's not a social call. I went up the stairs at my sister's house, knocked on the door, constantly knocked on the door. As I was knocking, something just didn't feel right. I went to the neighbor, asked the neighbor, have you seen my sister? He said, not since she left that morning with the kids. Is everything okay? I said, something is not right with my sister. 24-year-old Tyresa Mack is a devoted single mother of three. That afternoon, she missed her baby's doctor appointment and failed to pick up her older kids from daycare. As I'm constantly knocking on the door, it's just something telling me that she was in there. That's why I didn't give up on just like walking away or anything because she didn't get the kids from school and this is not like her. When it came down to the kids, she didn't play. At her wit's end, Sharabia insists the neighbor help her break down the door. The whole house was clean. As I proceeded into her room, you could tell somebody went through a war in there. As soon as I saw her, I knew, because the way she looked in the position, I just outright knew she was not living. It's clear Tyresa was the victim of a ferocious attack. She's partially clad, her clothing torn, a telephone cord wrapped around her neck. I had a feeling that something was wrong, but I didn't expect her to be dead. Detective Rodney McKean of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Department is the first investigator on the scene. On the date of the incident, my team was working the evening shift. The call came in approximately two blocks from the station, so we got there rather quickly. Upon entering the victim's apartment, everything initially is seen to be in orderly condition. However, upon entering the victim's bedroom, it was in total disarray. What this meant for us was that this was a, a violent struggle that took place in that bedroom. She was half naked, and her body itself, she had a huge abrasion. The, the skin had literally been scraped off of her nose. The victim had a cord around the neck. Upon closer observation, the victim also had trace marks on her wrist that appeared the cord had previously been there. Bound and raped, or so it seems from the traces of semen found on the victim's body. Investigators also notice a ring mark on her left finger, but the ring is nowhere to be found. While we were conducting a walk through the apartment, specifically the living room area, I located an entertainment center. The entertainment center had a clear dust pattern. It definitely appeared like a TV had been there and recently been removed. The missing TV and ring lead investigators to think robbery was the prime motive, but not all the pieces of the puzzle are adding up. I asked Rabia if her sister had any known enemies or if she knew of anyone that might want to bring harm to her. There's no sign of forced entry. Is it possible that Tyresa and her killer knew each other? So it's like, who could have did this? She don't even let strangers in her house. So it had to be somebody she kind of knew, and we just didn't know. You know, it was very difficult. Tyresa Mack was born in 1975, the third of six siblings. She grew up in Jacksonville, and after high school, went to work, single-handedly supporting her three young children. 
she was very outgoing, determined, a good parent. If she didn't have a job, she would get another one. She went on an interview that morning. On the last day of her life, Tyresa Mack wakes up early and sees her kids off to daycare. She then spends the morning job hunting without success in the near 100 degree heat. It's not easy getting or keeping a job when you have a baby suffering with asthma. We learned that Teresa Mack had had a lot of problems at work concerning time she had to take off in regards to taking her child to the doctor. On the day of her death, uh, she actually had a doctor's appointment scheduled for the child at 3 p.m. Tyresa heads home to cool off around 1 p.m., but she doesn't intend to be there long. She needs to get her older kids before heading to the doctor. This particular day, she was supposed to get them from school because the baby had an appointment. Well, at 5, they brought them to my grandmother's house which wasn't normal for that day because she was supposed to pick them up. Teresa's grandmother had tried to contact Teresa multiple times that afternoon by telephone to no avail. As a result, she contacted Sharabia by phone and asked her if she knew where her sister was. Uh, Sharabia had no idea but immediately headed over to the apartment. While Teresa's body is sent for autopsy, detectives canvass the neighborhood. They're in luck. Two witnesses recall seeing a tall black man leaving the apartment around one in the afternoon. We identified two witnesses during the investigation. One of them observed the suspect exit the apartment building with the TV in his hand. Both of the witnesses observed the suspect enter a vehicle and leave the area. The next day, police show the witnesses a number of mugshots that match the suspect's description, but neither is able to ID a suspect. Meantime, Tyrese's family comes up with a suspect list of their own. We learned about four individuals that knew the victim around the time of her death. We conducted thorough interviews with each one of these individuals, during which time we also obtained consensual DNA from them. Ultimately, none of these individuals match the description provided by the two witnesses. In the lab, a possible lead. Technicians are able to get a DNA sample from the semen at the crime scene, find a match, and they could solve the crime. The DNA database is composed of known profiles. Uh, our suspect was not in the database. As a result, you're left with a profile and you're trying to find a match. It's almost like a needle in a haystack. Unless you find that particular suspect that matches, investigation continues. Despite the killer's apparent recklessness, he's managed to elude detectives at every turn. Evidence at the scene, we had the phone cord, uh, we had the DNA evidence that was unidentified. We had numerous latent prints that were taken, but none of which identified a suspect for us. So once we excluded the persons of interest, uh, we really had nowhere to go with the investigation. Teresa Mack, by all accounts, was a very good citizen. She was a young mother. She worked. And we really could identify no one who would have a real motive to kill her. Um, Detective McKean kept working the case, but... He essentially exhausted all the investigative leads and, and, and there was no suspect. Weeks, then months go by without a single lead. A murderer is at large and there are still so many unanswered questions. What would have made the person do it? Why her out of all people? Not to say I would want anyone to get killed, but she had kids, she had a baby, you know, why her? The murder of Tyresa Mack is filed away as a cold case. It will stay that way for four more years until one winter day in Jacksonville when the vicious killer strikes again. And this time, he won't be satisfied with just one victim. It's been four years since single mother Teresa Mack was found raped and strangled to death in her apartment. The killer is still flying under the radar, but not for long. Jacksonville resident Sarah Anthony is looking for her close friend and neighbor, Nakia Kilpatrick. The 19-year-old single mother is pregnant with her third child, and Sarah hasn't heard from her in several days. That's when she hears some movement inside. One of the kids comes to the window and opens the blinds. Sarah can see inside and see that the house is a mess. 
She can see Nakia lying on the ground, unresponsive, laying halfway in the bedroom out of the bathroom. Sarah quickly runs for help. The children were left alone in that apartment with their deceased mother. Once we entered the apartment, we could tell that they had been scavenging for food. You could see open cereal boxes and anything that they could get to to feed themselves. And uh, we felt that if they were in there a couple of more days, they would have been deceased themselves. As a CSI unit begins its search for clues, homicide detectives focus on the body. Uh, we noticed that she had been there a couple of days. Um, we could tell that she had been bound, um, and there was a cable, a uh, TV cable around her neck and a slip knot. Um, it was obvious that she had been strangled. The killer has left no fingerprints behind, and there's no sign of forced entry. After a thorough search, the only evidence investigators have to go on is a swab of semen collected from the victim's body. We found a sample, but we were unable to determine if the killer had been sexually assaulted by the killer or she had consensual sex uh, with someone else. There was no uh, indications that uh, she had been forced to have sex. Detectives canvassed Nakia's neighborhood, but either no one's seen anything or nobody's talking. Well, the case went cold pretty quickly. The family was calling. You know, I felt bad. I couldn't do anything for the family. And then the next thing you know, we got another call about another dead girl. Ten days after the murder of Nakia Kilpatrick, another young woman is found dead in her apartment. And this victim lives just a mile down the road. You know, you get that feeling when the hair on the back of your, your neck raises up and you realize that you have something in the same area of another black female in, the, in an apartment that's been strangled, she's pregnant, and everybody in the department is wondering what do we have on our hands at this point. Detective David D.P. Smith is assigned to the new case. Shawanda McAllister was an African-American female. Uh, she was approximately 20 years old. She was going to school, trying to learn to get into the medical field. She was two to three months pregnant, just a real hard-working, easy-going young lady. The first person police want to talk to is Shawanda's living boyfriend, Jamaican-born Rashid Tope. He willingly admits he broke into the apartment that night, but says it was his only way in after forgetting his keys. Rashid told us that he got back around 11.30 that night. He could not get anyone to answer the door, so he removed the window and uh, entered the apartment that way. That's when he claims he found his girlfriend dead. He was face down on the floor uh, at the foot of her bed. She was naked from the waist down. Her Both ankles had been tied together with an electrical cord that had been cut off the TV set. And around her neck was another electrical cord that had been cut off an appliance there. And that's what killed her. The extension cord around Shawanda's neck is tied in the same unique slipknot found at the scene of Nakia Kilpatrick's murder just 10 days earlier. I was called down to Detective Smith's crime scene, and I can almost immediately see the similarities. And it wasn't just the slipknot. It was the, the young, young black female. She was pregnant. She could have been sexually assaulted. Um, almost immediately, it smelled like the same suspect. During uh, our search, we did find a used condom that was in very close proximity to Shawanda. It was laying on the floor. CSI officers quickly get to work. But besides the condom, there's only one other potential clue. In the apartment, we found a receipt, an ATM receipt, where uh, Shawanda had went to her bank and had drawn some 240-something dollars. It's time-stamped around 8.30 that evening. But before Detective Smith can follow up on this lead, he gets an order to bring Rashid Tope in for questioning. My sergeant said, uh, we need to talk to the boyfriend. He's got a real wild story. You need to talk to him about this right now. I had to find out real fast, so I decided I need to take him on down and start questioning him at the police station. As news of the latest murder spreads through Jacksonville, the city's fear and fury only grow. Police must end this string of killings as soon as possible.
Do they finally have the murderer in custody? Or is there someone still out there just waiting to strike again? Ten days into the new year, 1999, two young black women, both pregnant, are found strangled to death with electrical cords in Jacksonville, Florida. Both appear to have been raped before they were murdered. Back at the Jacksonville crime lab, technicians discover that the DNA found on Nakia Kilpatrick perfectly matches the DNA recovered from the condom near Shawanda McAllister's body. But the match brings detectives no closer to identifying their man. We definitely knew at that time that this wasn't this guy's first rodeo. He knew what he was doing. Well, we believe that the victims knew the suspect, and it may have been a consensual sexual relationship, but we did believe it was the same guy. Authorities are now focused in on Rashid Tope, Shawanda's boyfriend. He was a, a young African-American male, about 20 years old, and uh, he was trying to sell us on this outlandish story. Rashid tells police that he and Shawanda started out the evening at the local laundromat. Rashid was a plumber by trade. Shortly before 7 that evening, he left Shawanda going to one of our local technical schools to attend class for the plumbing trade. Rashid says he returned home a couple of hours later. He didn't have the keys to his apartment. The door was locked. He heard music playing. And at some point, he heard another male inside uh, the apartment with Shawanda. Shawanda tells him, you need to go away and come back later. I'll explain everything to you later. He says, well, I, I've got to have my work clothes. That's whenever Rashid says, Shawanda, why are you doing this to me? You're pregnant with our baby. Rashid claims he complied with Shawanda's wishes. Moments later, she placed his clothes in the hall and relocked the door. But Rashid never saw the male who was inside the apartment. He only heard him speak. The description he gave to us was he was sure it was a black male because of the sound of his voice. He could not tell us anything else about him. Detective Smith asks the suspect to take a polygraph. Rashid uh, passed that polygraph with a plus nine, which is a very good score. He did not show any signs of deception. As a final check, Rashid is asked to provide a sample of his DNA for comparison with the semen from the crime scene. The test results are negative. Rashid is not a match. I came out of the interview room and I told my sergeant, I said, uh, this ain't our guy. We've got to start all over again. D.P. Smith turns his attention back to the bank receipt found in Shawanda's apartment. The interesting thing about the withdrawal was that on the night of the murder, Shawanda withdrew that money at 8.30 which was only 30 minutes before Rashid got home from his class. Police recover the bank security tape and bring it to Jacksonville's tech unit to see if they can enhance the image. Finally, they see what they're looking for. Video surveillance of the ATM transaction uh, showed Shawana McAllister standing in front of the ATM machine, uh, withdrawing money, and behind her was a vehicle uh, with its headlights on and the lights on top of the car were on. Uh, now, when we looked closer at the video, we could tell that this was a taxi cab, but you could not tell what the name of the cab company was, nor could you see anyone sitting inside of it. Detective Smith scans his notes from the crime scene. He has two witnesses who recall seeing a cab in front of the victim's building that night. We found two neighbors that approximately 9 to 9.30, they saw a Gator City cab uh, pull up in parks. Uh, close to the vicinity of Shawana's apartment. One of these neighbors describes a black male climbing into the cab at around 11.30 p.m. and driving away. Rashid had told us that uh, Shawanda extensively used cabs. We began to think that maybe this was our first real break. Investigators head to the cab company to find out who could have driven Shawanda around on the night she was killed. I started interviewing the uh, tax cab drivers. All the ones I interviewed didn't know a thing in the world. They remembered Shawanda, but they couldn't tell me anything significant about uh, 
or murder or anything. But not all the company's drivers are accounted for. Two weeks later, before investigators can track down the missing cab driver, the Jacksonville Strangler strikes again. In the northwest section of Jacksonville, a man was working construction. He heard the sound of puppies barking. He went to investigate, and he saw a body of a young African-American female. He immediately uh, went off and called the police. My partner and I arrived at the scene. My partner um, told me that he saw something a few feet uh, behind where I was standing. We went and investigated, and we found the body of a second African-American female. Both young women had been reported missing by their families several days earlier. Their bodies each bear signs of strangulation. The similarities with the Kilpatrick and McAllister cases are too clear to ignore. One was uh, lying in the open. The other was uh, partially covered with pine needles and leaves. Upon further examination, we discovered that her hands were bound. Police say her body was dumped here in this construction site. They were both strangled. But who are they? I spoke to one of our missing persons detectives, and she gave us a potential identification on the two victims. She um, stated that she had been looking into the disappearance of Javonna Jefferson and Sarita Cohen for quite some time. 17-year-old Javanna Jefferson was reported missing after she failed to return from a trip to the store. The ghost family told me that on the morning of her disappearance, she received a phone call from a man she referred to as D. She left um, the house to meet D, and that was the last time they saw her alive. Police combed through the missing girl's phone records searching for this mystery man. After eliminating dozens of friends and family members, they are left with just one name, Paul DeRusso. Is he their missing link? Our chain of command. This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. We decided it was a good idea for all the detectives involved in all the investigations to get together in a single room and formulate a game plan. One of my uh, partners on our team came to me and says, DP says, there's a missing persons detective that is working a case where there's a missing young African-American female, uh, and it's got something to do with a taxi cab driver. And I asked her, I said, you got a missing persons dealing with a taxi cab driver? She said, yeah, I do. I said, well, what is the taxi cab driver's name? And she says, it's a guy by the name of Paul DeRusso. Now, the hunt is on. At this point in our investigation, we had no idea um, how big the investigation was, how dangerous this individual may be, or how far back this investigation would take us. A serial killer is on the loose in Jacksonville, Florida, and he's working fast. Four young black women have been strangled to death in the first five weeks of the new year. Authorities can only guess when and where this predator will strike next. We realized there was a very methodical killer. He had killed in the past and appeared likely to kill in the future, and law enforcement had to devote all their resources to finding this person. Their prime suspect's name is Paul DeRusso, a local cabbie believed to have had contact with at least two of the victims before their murders. Investigators dig into the suspect's past. DeRusso enlisted in the U.S. Army at the age of 22 and was stationed in Germany. Well, Paul DeRusso uh, meets his wife while serving in the Army in Germany. Uh, she was also serving in the Army. Uh, two of them got married. They were transferred to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, where um, his wife gave birth to two daughters. But DeRusso's got a troubled past. He had an extensive criminal history, which included burglary, domestic battery, sexual battery. He never did any extensive prison time. It seemed like the prosecutors weren't able to make any of the cases stick. DeRusso is first arrested at the age of 21 for carrying a concealed firearm, but receives just three years probation. While stationed in Georgia, he is once again taken into custody, this time on charges of kidnapping and rape. We found that he had been uh, disarmedly discharged from the Army. Uh, and checking his arrest record, we see that he would, uh, uh, he's like he lived a charmed life. Yes, he'd get arrested, but the charge would either be dropped or he would plead or get convicted of a lesser charge. He just kept going. And to me, and when you get a person like this that thinks he can get away, uh, without having to answer for his crimes, then to me, they become very dangerous. 
and they're, they're going to escalate. Shortly after his discharge, DeRusso moves his family to Jacksonville, where he works a series of odd jobs, including a brief stint as an auto mechanic. We had found in his criminal history that DeRusso had been arrested in 2001 uh, for sexual battery on a 19-year-old female here in Jacksonville. Tamika Thomas was walking to work. She said that Paul DeRusso pulled up next to her. He asked her if she was single. Um, she said that uh, when she got off of work, he was there. He gave her a ride home, and um, she um, described him as being handsome and charming. Tamika Thomas said that uh, she and Paul DeRusso engaged in consensual sexual activity on numerous occasions. She said that she caught him with a passion mark on his neck and uh, broke off the relationship. After she broke up with uh, Paul DeRusso, he flipped out. He grabbed her by the neck, he slammed her against her dryer, picked her up, carried her upstairs, ripped off her clothing, and sexually battered her. She said he also said that if he couldn't have her, nobody would. DeRusso is arrested for sexual battery, but skirts justice once again when his lawyers get the charges reduced to simple assault. I determined who the detective was on that case, and I called him up and I said, uh, did you take a cheek swab off of your suspect? And he said, uh, yeah, it's normal for us to do that. But it will take several days to compare the suspect's DNA against that from the crime scenes. Meantime, investigators need as much hard evidence as they can get if they're going to nail this slippery suspect. In the state of Florida, once you arrest someone for the charge of murder, you have a certain amount of time to bring this person to trial. The clock starts ticking the minute you put that arrest docket on him. And if you can't do it in that amount of time, it's over with. The case is done with forever. Uh, so we, we had to figure out some way to get uh, DeRusso off the street because we, we just knew he was going to kill again. DeRusso's 2001 assault on Tamika Thomas gives police the break they're looking for. Turns out the suspect isn't making good on the terms of his probation. One of the conditions of his probation was that he attend psychosexual counseling classes. He wasn't doing that. That enabled them to arrest him for violating his probation. SWAT units descend on Paul DeRusso's house and prepare to take him down. He was uh, placed in our county jail, and he remained there while we built our case against him. The deeper investigators dig, the more they learn about this predator and his method for stalking victims. I visited a friend of Nakia's, and I showed her a photo spread. She immediately identified DeRusso as a person who picked Nakia up, wooed her, and eventually got inside her apartment. DeRusso took advantage of his job as a taxi driver and his natural charm to win over another victim, Shawanda McAllister. One of the people I interviewed uh, stated that the day of Shawanda's death was the first day that Paul DeRusso uh, was on the job. Uh, that uh, Paul DeRusso picked Shawanda up downtown and uh, transported her to her apartment somewhere between 3 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Whenever Paul DeRusso come back uh, to Shawanda's house that night, somehow we assumed that he talked his way in. There was no signs of forced entry or anything like that. So uh, apparently he was welcomed into the house. For both my victims, I was uh, able to establish uh, phone contact between DeRusso and the victims, um, both prior to their disappearance and on the day of their disappearance. Finally, the DNA test results are in, and the crime lab has some good news for investigators. This is, uh, we have a positive match on Paul DeRusso's DNA off of the evidence found at Shawanda McAllister's crime scene. We also have a positive match on Paul DeRusso's DNA found on the evidence gathered at Nikhil Kilpatrick's crime scene. And at that point, uh, I'll never forget it, I said, we've got it. Investigators charged DeRusso with five counts of first-degree murder of multiple victims, as well as two counts of child abuse for confining Nakia Kilpatrick's children with their mother's dead body. 
We brought DeRusso into the interview room, uh, Detective Smith and myself. We just started with small talk and talking about family and friends and the military just to kind of lower his guard. He acted very aloof. He acted arrogant. He was not worried in the least bit because he thought this was something else that he could get away with and not be held accountable for. And then eventually we started talking about the girls. Now, investigators turn up the heat. We had another office set up with the timeline of all the murders. And so after we got into the interview, we decided to get up, take him into that room, and present the timeline to him. The only thing that he would admit to, yeah, I got arrested those times, but I didn't have to do with those murders. You can't connect me with anything. We showed him evidence of his DNA being in the victims. He denied ever having sex with the victims or any other evidence that we provided. He didn't realize that having his DNA in the, in the victims was just as damning. Detectives are convinced they've nailed the Jacksonville Strangler, so they're shocked when the district attorney rejects their case. He says it relies too heavily on circumstantial evidence. The DNA evidence only proves that DeRusso has sex with the victims. There isn't a shred of proof that he killed them. But investigators are determined to keep this dangerous man from going free. We wanted to get things like phone records, interview witnesses, do a number of other things to see if, if there was any merit whatsoever to that before we actually filed homicide charges and before we started a speedy trial clock ticking on him. In their search for rock-solid proof of DeRusso's guilt, they go hunting for any old crimes that fit his M.O. At the time of DeRusso's arrest, I was assigned to the cold case unit. Uh, my team made a decision to review previously unsolved cases that may be linked to DeRusso. Uh, the parameters of that were cases involving bindings, uh, strangulation, uh, black females. I immediately thought of the Teresa Mack investigation of 1999. After so many years, have police finally found Tyrese's killer? I remember reading articles, cab driver accused of murder. And after reading all that and seeing him, I, we knew him, not know him personally, but we seen him. He worked in our neighborhood. So he was shocked. This is the guy. Authorities have Jacksonville cab driver Paul DeRusso in custody for a string of murders. But their case relies too heavily on circumstantial evidence to guarantee a guilty verdict. So they scour through their files, hunting for any overlooked clue that could help them nail the suspect. We knew that Paul DeRusso's DNA was already linked to several of our victims. We knew he had killed multiple times in the past. And we didn't know if we had the full universe of the murders he had committed. So detectives had to start looking through older cases to see if there were any similarities. I pulled about a dozen cases which I presented to the lab personnel. The first case on my list was the Teresa Mack case of 1999. I knew that that case had been thoroughly worked, that we had an unidentified sample, and I was eager to see if there was a match. On a hot summer day, single mother of three, Teresa Mack, was raped and strangled to death in her own home. But no one could ever find a link to her killer, and the case went cold. Until now. The lab took the, the four-year-old vaginal swabbing from Tyrese Mack. They compared it to Paul DeRusso's known DNA profile, and it was a 13-marker hit, which is a, forensically, that's as strong as it gets. Police contact Sharabia Mack and deliver the news. They think they've finally caught her sister's killer. She was extremely excited. She appeared very grateful that we hadn't forgotten about her sister. That was like the best day of my life for him to sit and tell me that. He had found the person who killed my sister, gave me the name, which was Paul DeRusso. And I'm like, okay, wow. But there's still work to do. I conducted a review of my previous investigation. That included going through a lengthy report, during which time I reviewed statements made by witnesses, the persons of interest, and all the evidence associated with the case. Pretty much everything was checked. DeRusso's tactics with his other victims lead police to believe he must have known Tyresa prior to her death. Tyresa told me and my grandmother that it was a guy that liked her. He bought her a ring, but she wouldn't accept it. 
She never gave us a name, so we didn't know him. Investigators are now able to piece together what they think happened that fateful afternoon. DeRusso probably charmed his way inside, then turned on Tyresa like an animal. We do know that it was sexual and it was not consensual. Tyresa does her best to fight back, but DeRusso is too strong. And when he binds her with the cord, there's nothing more she can do. It's a pattern he'll repeat over and over again. DeRusso exits the apartment, making sure he leaves no fingerprints behind. Cold as ice, he snatches Tyresa Mack's ring and her TV on the way out. One witness saw him holding a TV at his car. Uh, another witness saw him wearing a blue, almost like a work uniform. We knew that Tyresa Mack was missing a television, and we knew that Paul DeRusso was working at the time of this murder for an auto mechanic company and was required as part of his job to wear a blue work uniform. Investigators review the witness statements from that day. I went back to our first witness. I put together a photo spread. Photo spread consisted of six photos, one of which was DeRusso. The other five photos were what we call filler material. These are subjects of similar race, complexion, characteristics. I presented the photo spread to the witness and he immediately identified DeRusso as the suspect. But the second witness is not so sure. She says she only saw DeRusso from the side. Investigators return with a new photo spread of profile shots. Paul DeRusso has a very distinctive side profile. If you look at him, he has a very pronounced Adam's apple. I met with Prosecutor Mac Hebner. He informed me that my case was the strongest case against Paul DeRusso. He told me to get ready for trial. But the district attorney stuns the press when he declares that DeRusso will only be tried for a single murder, that of Tyresa Mack, and the state will be seeking the death penalty. In the Tyresa Mack case, we had a full DNA profile match. Uh, we had witnesses, eyewitnesses who had placed him at the scene of the crime at the time we thought the homicide took place. The law also permits us to present similar crimes as evidence in that case, and we advised the court that we would also be presenting evidence of the murders of Nikia Kilpatrick and Shawanda McAllister because they were the most similar to the murders of Tyresa Mack. The sheriff says he hopes Paul DeRusso's arrest will bring them some comfort and bring relief to the people of Jacksonville. And the community breathes a sigh of relief that a serial killer who once preyed upon young women in our community is off the street. After a two-week trial, Paul DeRusso is found guilty of first-degree murder in the death of Tyresa Mack. The penalty phase of the trial lasted about a week, and on June 28th of 2007, the jury, by a vote of 10 to 2, recommended the death sentence for Paul DeRusso. DeRusso appeals his conviction, but it's quickly denied. Jacksonville's killer cabbie now sits on Florida's death row, where he continues to wait for execution. This case is, uh, to me, was a, was a rare one that I've ever been involved in, and in that the whole homicide unit worked on this case. I've never seen this kind of cooperation in the whole 32 years that I was a policeman. As a homicide investigator, you are the last voice that can speak for that victim. This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised.